Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, taking time out of your day. Important time to spend with us this morning. Uh, our hope is at the end of the breakfast, you'll take away something that will help you with your business decisions for the remainder of 2015. Um, I'd like to start out first by thanking our sponsors um, because our sponsors allow, allow this event to happen. First of all, uh, Bury, our platinum sponsor over at this table who actually did the engineering for this building. Thank you, Bury and Jim Knight. Gold sponsors, Rosewood Property Company, uh, Bill Flaherty, led by Bill Flaherty. Thank you, Rosewood, once again. Uh, we are a tenant in their building. It's a beautiful facility. Tremel Crow Company with Scott Krikorian leading. Thank you, Scott. Silver sponsors, Vincent and Elkins, uh, Pacific Builders. And then bronze sponsors, Page, Hillwood, and Hines. Thank you for your multi-year support uh, that allows this to happen. Uh, one reminder, if you could, uh, please silence your cell phones, PDAs. Uh, for the for the speakers, and t on today's agenda, we have we're going to lead off with Ken McCarthy. And those of you who have joined us in the past, uh, Ken has been our speaker at the last few events. He is our chief economist. He's going to go uh, global, national, and then Texas specific. A little deeper dive than he did last year. Uh, as there's there is a lot of movement in the economy, and then we will have Q and A for Ken right after he speaks, and then we will have the mayor. Uh, come on about 8.15, and then we will have Q&A for the mayor afterwards. Um, last year, if you remember, we did a, a quick poll, audience poll, and we had four questions, and uh, we have the results of the poll. Uh, we had the question, will the U.S. economy, which grew at 3.2% annualized rate in 2013, fourth quarter, will it grow more or less in 14? The audience voted less. Uh, you were correct. 60 set, the second question, 67,000 jobs were created in DFW in 2013. Would it be more or less in 14? You voted more. It was more. It was double 2013. You'll hear more about that in a little bit. Uh, the third question was, the federal government spends about 22% of the GDP, U.S. GDP, it spent in 2013. Would it be more or less in 14? You voted more. You were correct. The last question was, Will the Dallas Cowboys or Washington Redskins make the playoffs? It was uh, neither, and you were wrong, as Dallas made the playoffs. Uh, looking forward, there, as I mentioned, there's a lot going on in the economy, and, and specifically in Texas. Some recent headlines that we, we pulled are 457,900 Texas jobs were created last year, 136 1,900 in DFW alone. That's 375 net new jobs a day in DFW. Home prices up 12%. If you saw the headline this morning, that was this morning as well. Commercial real estate rents are up 15% in some markets in 2014. Dallas unemployment is at 4.6% annualized. All these headlines are frothy for some of us who have been in the business for a few cycles. So it causes us to pause and contemplate. So what we did, we got our group together last week and we come up, came up with four predictions for 2015 uh, in DFW. The first has to do with commercial rent rates. Our professionals got together and we're predicting in 2015 that office rents will be slightly higher than 14. At, at, this is at the end of the year, December 31st, 2015. So office rates are going to be slightly higher. Industrial rates will be flat to lower, and that's primarily because we have 17 million square feet of industrial being delivered in this market uh, in 2015. It's a tremendous amount. Retail, due to consumer spending and the tax cut through the energy price uh, decrease, we think retail rents are going to be higher. Second prediction we're making is West Texas Intermediate Crude is going to end the year at 64.18 per barrel. <laughs> that was uh, our, our appraisal department, which serves kind of like an actuarial department. Third is there will be at least one major corporate relocation to DFW uh, from today going forward in 2015. And the fourth is there will be an amendment called the Prolate Spheroid Amendment. And the Prolate Spheroid Amendment has to do with someone grabbing a Prolate Spheroid taking two steps and lunging, and that will be called a catch. It's going to be called, the, in layman's term, the Des Bryant Amendment to the NFL rules. A prolate spheroid is a football. So we think there will be a rule change, and the Cowboys will go further in the playoff next year. 
We're going to start off with Ken McCarthy uh, right now, and Ken's going to go a deep dive on the economy, and then we'll do questions and answers. Thank you very much. Okay, we're good. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's feeling pretty good today. You all all right? Yes, sir. Yep. I, I think you should be. I think it's a great time to be in the U.S. economy today. I think right now we're in what I would call the sweet spot of the economic cycle. We've finally gotten to the point where the economy has taken off. If you look back historically, <clears throat> over the last you know, several decades, whenever the economy comes out of a recession, there's always a period of time when the economy grows at a very strong rate. We call it, economists would call it above trend growth. Uh, this time around, that above trend growth, normally it, ha it happens, I should say, very early in the cycle. You come out of the cycle, the economy really takes off, we get a couple of years of, of really strong growth, and then you sort of slow back down, back to trend. This time around, we did the opposite. We came out really slowly, took a long time to build the momentum, but we're finally there. Uh, if you look back over the last year or so, the U.S. economy after the first quarter, which was something of a disaster because of the weather, if you look back since then, the economy began to take off. And now, you know, with the numbers we've seen, particularly over the past few weeks, it's pretty clear the U.S. economy is growing at an extremely strong rate, and that's likely to continue, I believe, for at least another year to two years. So we're looking at it, we're in a period right now that I would call you know, the sweet spot in the cycle. We finally got that above trend growth and we're likely to continue to grow at a strong rate for probably uh, another year to, to 18 months to, to two years. The reasons for this, and I'll go into this in a little bit more detail, uh, are first of all, uh, businesses have changed their behavior. Uh, this happens every cycle at some point. Uh, I like to say businesses go from worrying about holding down costs to worrying about losing sales. If you will, if you, for the, to extend the, the football analogy, they go from playing defense to playing offense. That happens, and when that switch goes on, when that light goes on, that's when the economy really starts to take off. That has happened. Confidence is rising, it's very high, and as a result, businesses are hiring much more aggressively, and the economy is really, really taking off. And as a result of this, consumers <coughs> have increased their spending. We haven't yet really hit that strong boom in consumer spending that we get at every cycle. I think we're about to have that. But we're, we're seeing a combination of pent-up demand. Uh, I, I know I've been doing this for a couple of years, so I'll just you know, briefly say that you know, in the past couple of years, I've noted that uh, pent-up demand is when things wear out, you finally have to go buy them. Uh, and over the past couple of years, I've said that my wife, we needed a new refrigerator, and my wife kept, I kept saying no, no, no. Well, in the last year, I bought the refrigerator and the dishwasher and the car, okay? So yeah, what happens is you get to the point where you have to do it, and that's, that's being activated. Along with that, of course, we now have more confident consumers. We have rising employment. We have rising income, and we have that extra bonus for everyone outside of Texas, lower oil prices. So. For, for consumers, that's, a, that's the equivalent of a tax cut. Uh, so that, we think, will continue. Uh, and ad additionally, I think we'll finally start to see some improvement in wages. Now, that'll be very, that'll be very helpful. Are there some potential headwinds? Well, yeah. It, it's, a, it's a very volatile world out there right now outside the U.S. Uh, I don't think that it's likely that, that um, conditions outside the U.S. will have a significant impact on our economy this year, and the main reason for that is because uh, most of what's happening in the U.S. is happening domestically. It's consumers, it's businesses in the U.S. that are, that are driving this. It's not being caused by higher exports or, or things like that. So, uh, so I don't think that we're likely to see, have, feel any significant negative effects uh, from volatility outside the U.S., but it's something to keep an eye on always. And of course, the other uh, thing that will happen this year, I think, I've been predicting this for three years, and I've been wrong for three years, I think I'm going to be right this year, o interest rates will rise. Uh, at some point this year, clearly the Fed is going to move from uh, this massive easing that they've been doing for the past five years to a tighter monetary policy. They'll start to raise short-term rates. As that occurs, we'll start to see longer-term rates ra rise. Those kinds of shifts in monetary policy can have uh, disruptive impacts on the markets can affect 
uh, how, uh, how the markets behave, and, and that can have an impact on confidence. So you know, the, the, it, this has been well telegraphed, and I don't think it's likely to have a big impact, but it's something always, always to keep an eye on. So I do think that right now we are, we are uh, in a p position where we're going to see uh, healthy growth. So this is just uh, you know, my chart on uh, growth in the U.S. in this recovery compared to past recoveries. The, the bar on the left the, is 3.7. That's the previous four recoveries. We're five and a half years into this recovery, believe it or not. It began in, in 2009. I know it hasn't felt that way. As I said, that's because we haven't had that period of strong growth, but we're there now. Uh, but if you look back over the past four recoveries, during that five and a half year period, GDP growth averaged almost 4%. This recovery, it's averaged about 2.3%. So it was significantly slower than, and really half, of a typical recovery. However, the forecast is that this year we'll see 3.8 and next year 3.6. So we're finally, I think, taking off. Go to the next one. There we go. Uh, here's what's happening. Uh, it, we'll go through this. Businesses have become much more confident. This is a measure of business confidence put out by Moody's Analytics, uh, moodyseconomy.com. They, they poll uh, their clients every week, and they ask them a whole series of questions about their business and how it is compared to six months ago. And what we're looking at here is that you know, since really the beginning of 2013, this index has taken off. You know, back in 2013, late 12, early 13, things were still sluggish. And you can see really, since then it's really taken off. It's now at a record high. So businesses have, as I said, shifted and become much more confident in the future and in their business. Uh, they're, they're feeling much more comfortable about their sales. And as they're doing that, uh, they're changing their behavior. I'd like to look at another measure of the same thing. There's a, a, uh, an outfit called the National Federation of Independent Businesses. They've been doing this survey called Small Business Confidence, and they've been doing it for like forever, for about 40 years or so. And the optimism has finally come back to pre-recession levels. So small businesses who hire a lot of people, although it's not really small businesses, uh, it's what I call new businesses that tend to hire more people. Uh, and that's something we all need more of. Uh, but small businesses are much more confident. Uh, they're much more optimistic about the future. Their, their optimism is currently at the highest rate it's been since 2007. As a result, they're starting to look for people. In a much great, at a much greater pace than we've seen in the, in the past. This is one of those nerdy economist stats. It's called job openings. The, the government puts this out every month. Uh, job openings, uh, the number of, of actual openings in the, in the economy is currently at its highest level since 2001. So there's a lot of companies looking for a lot of people right now, and we're starting to see that activated in terms of employment growth. <clears throat> As a result, Employment growth, now this chart was created before last week's uh, jobs number. So the numbers on this chart are actually low uh, because of what happened with last week's employment report. Uh, but you can see what, I, what we like to look at here is, you know, as I said, in 2012, 2013, if you're looking at the, the line, this is year on year job growth. It was sitting at about 2.2 you know, million or so, 2 million, 2.5 and a half million. So we were adding about 175,000 jobs a month, 150,000 jobs a month. That's the way it was going, sort of slow but steady growth. Look what happened beginning in 2014. All of a sudden, the rate of growth began to accelerate uh, until by the end of 2014, the data that came out uh, before last week showed that we added about 3 million jobs in 2014. 3 million jobs in 2014 was the best year since 1999. So from December of 13 to December of 14, we added 3 million jobs in the US economy. Well, guess what? Last week, they came out with the annual revisions, and we didn't add 3 million jobs. We added 3.2 million jobs. They up upgraded everything. And in particular, they upgraded the job growth in the final two months of last year. That November is now estimated to have added 423,000 jobs in the US economy. That's the most in a non-census year, because in the census, the government always adds a lot of people. Uh, they lay them back off, but, but it, it, um, in, at that number, that 423,000 is the most in, most in a non-census year since 1997, in a one month. In addition, we added another 350,000 jobs in December. So the two months alone added more jobs than we've seen in any period since the mid-1990s. In addition, we added another 257,000 jobs. So we're now up to 3.2 million last year, and we're starting off this year at the same pace. 
So the U.S. economy, the em employers are finally aggressively hiring. They are uh, they're trying to g get in more people. And the one thing that hasn't happened in this cycle so far from a labor market perspective is what we haven't seen so far has been we haven't seen a lot of wage growth. Uh, you know, wages, average hourly earnings in the U.S. economy today are growing at about 2.2 percent, more or less. Inflation is about 1.8 percent and has been throughout this, this recovery pretty much. So real earnings are growing very slowly. I think that's about to change. And the reason is because we're finally tightening up labor markets to the point where it's getting harder for businesses to find the right people. Talk to my clients. I'm sure a lot of you are finding the same problem. It's, it's getting a little tough to find the right people for, to fill your jobs these days. So if we look at this is that same National Federation of Independent Business Survey. Uh, they, they ask a question about how difficult is it to find people. They say, you know, do you have at least one job that's hard to fill? And if you look at it, you know, back in 2010, there at the recession, nobody said that. Today, 25% of the respondents are saying they have at least one job that they're having a hard time finding someone. Uh, when that starts to happen, when labor markets start to tighten to the point where businesses are finding it hard to hire people, they start to raise wages. So these same biz small businesses now, over 20, almost 25% of them are raising compensation. Again, back to levels we haven't seen since before the recession, since 06, 07. So to me, this is the final piece in the puzzle that, that is going to cause the economy to, to grow even more strongly and cause consumers to start to really ramp up their spending. They're finally going to get that higher wage rate uh, that, that they've been waiting for, really, for a couple of years now. So if we look at income, after-tax income, this, this just shows growth in income, and this is income in the aggregate. So it's, it's, it's driven by two things. First of all, the number of people, more people, more income, and by the wage rates those people are being paid. You multiply them together and you get the, the aggregate income. And with the exception of 2012, and we all remember 2012, right? There was something called the fiscal cliff. So at the end of 2012, everyone took their income, their bonuses in, two, in December of 2012, so they wouldn't have to pay taxes on it in 2013. So we had a big bump in two, the December of 2012. You take that out, and you can see the, the opposite effect in 2013, right? It dropped. You go back to 2006 before you get the, way, the income growth that we had last year. And this is real. This is real. It's adjusted for inflation, and it's adjusted for taxes. So this is real growth in, po in income in people's pockets. And we think that's going to lead to much stronger consumer spending. In, spe in fact, you know, with our little optimism guy there, consumer confidence is now at its highest level since 2007 and really since 2005. It, it has really popped up in the last six months or so, the University of Michigan Sentiment Index. When it's above 90, that's generally consistent with strong consumer spending growth. Right now it's sitting at about 98. So consumers are finally starting to feel like they're getting their piece of the pie that the economy has finally started to get to the point where they're going to see higher wages, higher income, and that when that happens, what do Americans do? They buy cars. <coughs> the other bonus, of course, for consumers, uh, and it's the elephant in the room, I'm perfectly happy to discuss it, uh, it during Q&A, is that oil prices have dropped. For most American consumers, for every American consumer, a decline in oil prices is a tax cut, right? All right. It's estimated, uh, we, we use the Moody's folks for this, but you can do the same thing, that for every $10 decline in the price of oil, that frees up $30 billion in spending in the U.S. economy All right, over the next 12 months, because it's $30 billion you don't have to spend on oil. When that happens, all right, so we've dropped $60. $60 drop in oil prices is a $180 billion tax cut for the American consumer. And that is going to get spent. So you've got more income, more optimism, lower oil prices. And as I said, what do Americans do? They buy cars, right? So I, I'm in one of these statistics there for 2014. But 2014 saw uh, the highest level of, of US auto sales, over 16 million units for the first time since 2006. Uh, and it's clear that you know, that pent-up demand has been activated, and now with, with increasing optimism, the U.S. auto industry is pretty much back, uh, and we expect auto sales to remain healthy, certainly for, for this year and next year, and probably even beyond that. 
So now let's take a bit of a dive into Texas, uh, and then we'll, we'll break for Q&A. Uh, so Texas has led the way. You know, I love to be here. Uh, I, I think this is a terrific economy and a great state. It also helps that we have this every year in February, and I left an ice storm. <laughs> but, um, but seriously, you know, Texas has seen uh, some of the best growth in the U.S. economy over the past two decades. I wrote this stat down this morning as I was looking at some of my charts. Uh, since 1990, the U.S. economy has added 31 million jobs. Almost 5 million of those jobs have been created in Texas. So over the past 25 years, Texas has added more jobs than any other state in the union. The population is at a record high. This one, employment as a percent of, of, US, income, of US total employment. So back in 1990, Texas accounted for about 6.5% of a job. So think about that. It, it accounted for 6.5% of the jobs. It accounted for 15% of the growth over the last two decades. So we've seen a tremendous increase. Texas has far outpaced everything that's going on uh, throughout the US. And it's not just oil. Of course, oil, particularly over the past few years, has been an important contributor. But it's more than that. It's the entire environment, the business-friendly environment here, that creates an environment where businesses want to operate, where companies uh, want to grow. And I think you're probably right, Steve. Someone's going to come to Texas. Uh, someone big is going to come to Texas because it's a place, it's a great place to locate. So how many jobs have we added uh, since the recovery began? This is by state, and you can just see the top two states here uh, pretty clearly. Uh, so we're looking at job growth since February of 2010, which was when employment bottomed. Uh, Texas has added 1.5 million jobs, uh, more than any other state. Uh, t California, and that's largely Northern California, pretty clearly, the technology-driven jobs in, in Silicon Valley and San Francisco are the biggest piece of that. They've added uh, also about one and a half million jobs. And then there's a tremendous drop-off. Uh, so this is really where the growth has been in the U.S. economy. This recovery up to date has been driven by two things. It's been driven by energy, as we all know, the energy industry, and it's been driven by the technology or uh, creative industries that are surrounding the technology. Uh, and therefore, what we've seen has been the states and the localities that have shown the strongest growth have been cities and, and states that have one of those two industries. I think over the next two years, this recovery is going to broaden and deepen, and it's going to go back to the cities that hit, were hit hardest during the recession, back to the cities that have been the slowest to recovery, but were before that uh, stronger and, and more important cities. I'm talking about the Atlantas, the Phoenixes, uh, the Denvers, places like that. We're going to see much stronger growth as this recovery broadens and deepens throughout the U.S. economy. If we just look at last year, again, Texas, you know, there, there you can clearly see it. As Steve mentioned, you know, Texas added 458,000 jobs last year alone. All right. New U.S. economy added 3.2 million jobs. So Texas added more than 10 percent, almost 15 you know, percent, about 12 percent of all the jobs that were added in the U.S. economy were added in Texas. Uh, it continues to be uh, the, one of the most dynamic and strongest states in the country. Now let's take a, a little bit of a, a dive into Dallas. Uh, we'll just look at a couple of slides here. Uh, so uh, this just shows how Dallas has changed over the past two decades. We mentioned 1990, uh, there were about 2 million people working in the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. In, in 2014, there were, that's, that number is wrong, that 3.9, it's actually 3.2 million to 3.199. Uh, so, but still, you know, added 1.2 million jobs over the past 25 years in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Of those jobs, where has the growth been and where has the, uh, the contraction been? The professional services, professional and business services is things like accountants, lawyers, um, uh, at consultants, uh, any business that provides services to another business. That sector has gone from 11% of the jobs to almost 20%, 18%. Uh, the other sector that's grown tremendously has been education and health. Uh, and the sectors that have contracted no surprise, manufacturing. Uh, back in 1990, manufacturing was one, one out of every five jobs in Texas was, or in Dallas was a manufacturing job. Today, it's one out of every 10. So we've seen a contraction in manufacturing, but that's not just in Texas, that's everywhere. You know, if you look at the US, same story, exactly. So there's no, no real surprise there. So, and the other, um, what's the other sector that's been contracting, I think, is um, you know, government. Well, let's look at growth overall. 
uh, just look at the, three, the last three decades. In the 90s, Texas ad, or Dallas added over 800,000 jobs. In the mid-2000s, roughly 300,000, very, you know, relatively short recovery. So far, this recovery, we've outpaced everything we did in the early 2000s. We've added 420,000 jobs in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. If we continue at this pace, uh, we will surpass the 90s growth before this is over. Uh, if we get, you know, you'll see a chart about the forecast out to 2020 for whatever that's worth, but we'll, they, we will add more jobs in this recovery if we get, make it to 2020 than we have added in any recovery and any expansion uh, in the history of the state, of the city. Relative to the rest of the country, uh, Dallas tends to have more professional jobs, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, you know, we talk about the energy industry and its impact on the, on the Texas market, uh, but I think if the Dallas area in particular is much more diversified and much better able to withstand uh, the decline in oil prices than, than other cities that we won't name here. Uh, <clears throat> And you can see, you know, Dallas also has a, has a very strong financial services sector, uh, very strong wholesale. Uh, it's, a, it's a big distribution center uh, and less government and, um, and less on education and health. So the forecast, as I said, it goes out to 2020. Who knows? Uh, you know, I think you get much, before, much beyond uh, 2017, 2016, 2017, and it's all a crapshoot. Um, but basically, the projections are that if we continue at this rate, that as the U.S. economy goes through a period of strong growth this year, strong growth next year, then slows down back to trend. Nobody forecasts a recession, of course. Slows down back to trend that Dallas will add more jobs in this cycle than it has added since the 1990s and maybe even more than we did in the 1990s. So I, I want to conclude by trying to answer the question, I don't know if you can read it, in the, the heading up there, will the, will the momentum continue? I think the answer is definitely yes. Uh, I think that we are right now at that point in the cycle where we're going to have a couple of very good years. Finally, uh, I think this year, 2015, from an economic perspective and quite frankly from a commercial real estate perspective, is likely to be the best year uh, in a decade. Commercial real estate, you might say 07, 07 was a very good year. But basically, for, in terms of growth, it will be the best year in a decade. Uh, and Texas, which has led the way throughout this cycle, I think will continue to do so uh, along with the Dallas region. So uh, uh, to close, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm, I'm very, uh, I think it's going to be a very good couple of years here, both for the U.S. economy and for the commercial real estate industry. And in particular, I think the Texas economy will, will do extremely well. Uh, with that, I'm happy to open it up to questions. Please. Um, thank you very much for the optimistic forecast. That's great. Um, now, I don't, I don't mean overly optimistic. Thank you. I mean, I think that's really good. Can you talk a little bit about the um, structural headwinds in 2000, beyond 2016, 2017? For instance, McKinsey put out a report um, that talked about debt to mm -hmm. GDP, mm -hmm. not only here in the mm -hmm. United States, but mm -hmm. globally. And what's interesting is debt to P GDP, not only government debt, but also consumer debt and business debt, is higher today than it was in 2008. And I'm curious if you yeah. think that, as well as some other things, could be some sig significant structural headwinds for longer term future. Yeah, you know, um, people ask me um, what keeps you up at night. And if you ask my wife, she'd tell you nothing. But, um, but, if you, but if there was something that would keep me up at night, it would probably be what's going to happen with, uh, with the deficit and what's going to happen with debt in the economy. How are we going to eventually pay that down? Uh, I, I think that what we need to see is we need to see um, from, a, uh, you know, from a, a macro government point of view, we need to see the economy growing faster to create more, uh, more jobs and more income that will help us to offset that growth in debt. If the economy grows faster and incomes grow faster than debt does, then that overall share goes down. And, and that's what we need to see happen. So, so to me, the best way to address the debt problem is by creating an environment that allows for greater growth in the private sector. Anyone else? Ken, I'd like to have your thoughts on uh, the impending retirement of uh, Richard Fisher. Um, I think in 60 days, uh, the, there's going to be a new president uh, for the Dallas Fed. Uh, what are your thoughts on uh, who uh, might replace him, one, and two, um, 
in terms of growth and, and uh, uh, here regionally and, and uh, also nationally um, going forward? Um, I, I honestly don't follow local uh, regional Fed presidents, so I, I, I'm not sure uh, who's likely to replace him. Uh, I do know that uh, Dick Fisher has been a, a terrific uh, proponent of, um, of the, first of all, of the Texas region, but also I think of the, uh, the con more conservative um, uh, monetary policy. Um, and I, I would say that, um, you know, I guess um, what we need in the Fed is we need, um, you know, strong voices for, uh, for sensible policy, and I think that that at this point in the cycle probably means we need to start thinking about, um, you know, thinking beyond the the um, the current easy policy into as the economy starts to grow more rapidly, as it starts to create potential for inflation, how do we address that? So you know, I th I think. Uh, that we need to have someone who is more uh, attuned to what's going on in terms of uh, financial markets and in terms of the, the outlook for inflation right now than we do need someone who's more, uh, so we say, pro-growth. We're good? We're good. All right. Thank you.